Good afternoon, folks. Uh, thanks for, for joining us this afternoon for um, a very uh, informal uh, event. Uh, this is not going to be a lecture, per se, uh, but uh, we're delighted uh, and fortunate to have with us uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the role of the Solicitor General and uh, what it's like to litigate in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, um, Malcolm Stewart. Uh, Malcolm is a Deputy uh, Solicitor General. He's one of three so-called career deputies, which means he's a civil service uh, employee. He's not a political appointee. He's been with the Solicitor General's office since 1993. So that's uh, 25 years, I guess, uh, by my math. Um, so he has uh, uh, been there during a lot of different uh, uh, eras on the Supreme Court. A lot of different justices have come and gone uh, since he's been there. Um, he, as a deputy, kind of oversees certain, certain kinds of cases uh, in which the United States um, is uh, being represented in the Supreme Court, uh, and that is the role of the Solicitor General, General's Office, is basically to represent the United States um, uh, in the Supreme Court. Uh, um, in, uh, included in his portfolio are intellectual property cases, bankruptcy cases, securities law cases, Clean Air and Clean Water Act cases, tax cases. So many of the cases he's argued, and he's argued 78 cases in front of the U.S. Supreme Court in the last 25 years. Many of them, uh, you know, uh, probably he would be the only one in the room to have heard of, except those of us who teach in those uh, various areas. Uh, but this doesn't mean they're not important. Obviously, intellectual property is very important. Bankruptcy, taxes are important areas of law. They're just not the, the, uh, the controversial headline-grabbing kind of cases. Malcolm did, though, argue, and I'll mention this, he argued the Citizens United case on behalf of the federal government the first time around. So he argued to uphold the regulation of, of corporate uh, expenditures. Um, and uh, after that oral argument, uh, various of the justices decided they wanted additional briefing and another argument because apparently five justices wanted to do something bigger with that case. So the second time around, the Solicitor General herself, who was Elena Kagan under the uh, Obama administration, argued uh, uh, the Citizens United case and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the federal government lost uh, five to four, um, uh, notwithstanding the efforts of Malcolm and Elena. Um, Malcolm is a graduate of Princeton uh, undergrad. Uh, he went to Yale Law School, where he also earned a master's in history. Uh, he clerked for Patricia Wald, uh, who's a judge on the uh, uh, U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, and then uh, uh, with me uh, for Justice Harry Blackman on the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and as soon as he had a chance to go back and work um, uh, in the uh, Solicitor General's office, uh, he did that. There's a two-year ban when you clerk for the Supreme Court. You can't do any Supreme Court representation for at least two years. So he, uh, he went there in 1993. Who was the, uh, was it Walter Dellinger who was the uh, AG of the uh, SGU? Drew Days, uh, uh, who was a, a civil rights hero and a professor at, uh, at Yale Law School. He was the Solicitor General under, uh, under Bill Clinton when, when you started. Uh, Last thing I'll say, and then I'll turn it over to Malcolm to just offer some remarks and then open it up to questions about, you know, uh, who the Solicitor General's office hires, the, how, how, do they, how do they do their work, um, you know, tips on oral argument and, and briefing, et cetera, whatever you want to ask him about. He obviously can't talk about specific cases in which uh, the federal government uh, is or may be involved. Um, uh, the final thing I'll say is, you know, as, as much time as people uh, study and, and uh, work in front of the Supreme Court, um, it's a hard institution to predict. I remember uh, in 2000 um, talking to Malcolm and others for that matter uh, about the likelihood that the Supreme Court would grant review in the Bush versus Gore case. And, you know, I, a lot of my academic work involves uh, the Supreme Court and constitutional law and uh, the federal electoral process. Uh, and, of course, Malcolm, uh, as, a, as a person in the SG's office, uh, you know, knows a bit about the justices themselves. Uh, and, you know, there was a holiday season. It was the end of the year after the election. And, and Malcolm and I both kind of went to all our family members and friends and said, look, this is not the kind of case the Supreme Court would grant review on. There wasn't a clear federal question. It was more of a, st a state law question in Florida, blah, blah, blah. And so, uh, you know, uh, we all, you know, had a little egg on our face when they granted review. Uh, and so uh, life is always full of surprises when you're dealing with, uh, with those nine uh, um, uh, justices. So with that, let me
let me uh, uh, allow Malcolm to offer some remarks, and then he'll take Thank questions. You. Thanks, Matt. Uh, well, thanks very much for coming, and uh, I have a few things to say. I hope this will mostly be question and answer, and there will be a lot of time for question and answer in the end. And as I say things, if, if you want to break in with a question, just raise your hand. And when, whenever I talk to student groups, I say, if I'm allowed to speak uninterrupted for an extended period, it's going to be very disorienting, because usually when I speak in public, it's arguing before the Supreme Court, and to go 30 seconds without an interruption in that setting is, is really remarkable. So, so please don't uh, let me speak for too long. I, I wanted to talk first about what I, the composition of the Office of Solicitor General, who works there, kind of how is it staffed. Uh, the person at the head of the office, obviously, is the Solicitor General. Four deputies, as Vic said, three, three of the four deputies are career. One of them is a political appointee. The Solicitor General has to be appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate. Uh, the one political deputy doesn't have to be Senate confirmed, but is, is always an excellent lawyer, but somebody who has a political credential as well. Then we have 15 or 16 assistants, depending on the, the time, and they're all career employees as well. And by career, I mean we can, we don't uh, come and go with the administration. We can change from, we, we can stay in the office as one president changes over to another, and the idea is that we owe our allegiance to the, the Department of Justice and the people of the United States rather than to any one particular president. We, we also have four people on the staff known as Bristow Fellows. Uh, their fellowship program is named after Benjamin Bristow, who was the first SG back in 1870. It's a one-year internship typically for people who've just finished a Court of Appeals clerkship after law school. They work in our office for a year. They help with briefing and oral argument. They don't argue a case in the U.S. Supreme Court, but typically each of them will do a brief and argument in the Court of Appeals. And I, I feel like the program, they work very hard, but I feel like the program has been getting very good word of mouth because we, we always get extraordinary applicant pools. and. You know, I tell people I'm more or less qualified to be a deputy SG, but I could never be hired as a Bristow. I mean, no, no one would say about me the things that their recommenders say about them. Uh, we also have uh, some very well qualified support staff, uh, secretaries, paralegals, people who assist with the, the filing, and it, it's been a great place to work. It, w with respect to the division among the political and career appointees, I think that the office is really a microcosm of the executive branch. That is, as I, I always say, that it's import important to have political accountability at the top because the point of a democracy is that elections are supposed to matter, and so you, you don't want the decisions to continue to be made by people who are hold the, the final decisions to be made by people who are holdovers who. Uh, won't be replaced by virtue of the election. At the same time, I think it would be a disaster for the executive branch if the membership of the office turned over entirely. When a new president came in, you would lose your institutional memory. Uh, you would lose the subject matter expertise. And so I think it's important to have political accountability at the top. But as with most executive branch offices, the, the bulk of the day-to-day -day work is done by career employees who you know, they, they may be holdovers from the Obama administration or from the Bush administration or the Clinton administration, and, and even the people we hire for political uh, for career slots within the, the Trump administration are not necessarily going to be Republicans. They're, they're hired based on factors that don't include political orientation, and so I think it's always been great to work in an office that at any given time had a mix of Republicans and Democrats. I, I think you know, you increase the size of your applicant pool and the, the likelihood of getting good people, and I think you also are more likely to, to come to the right answer if you have a diverse group of people within the office who can point out potential flaws in the, the things people are proposing to do. The, one of the adjectives that's often used to describe the Solicitor General is independent, and in fact, some descriptions of the SG stress independence as the, the overriding characteristic of the job. I, I think it's important to kind of to be precise about what type of independence the Solicitor General has. The Solicitor General is, by statute, the fourth ranking officer within the Department of Justice behind the, the Attorney General, the Deputy Attorney General, and the Associate Attorney General. And the essence of being the fourth highest of anything is that you are subject to, to direction by the people who are 
above you on the chain of command. And so the Solicitor General can be directed in any particular case by the Attorney General to take a particular position in court. When we speak of the SG as being independent, what we mean is that that, that sort of direction very rarely occurs, that by tradition the SG is given functional equivalent uh, in independence. The Attorney General is very reluctant to override the, the SG's views, but the SG doesn't have the kind of independence that a district judge would have who, who could say to the Attorney General, I, I understand this is what you think the correct view of the law is, but I have a responsibility to decide the case based on my own conceptions of the law. Now, as a Deputy SG, I have virtually no contact with the Attorney General. I think the, the SG has pretty frequent contact with the AG, but I'm not really privy to those conversations. But my, my sense, not only now, but throughout the time that I've been in the office is the SG is always keeping the AG informed. It's very rare that the AG is giving specific directives as to what position to take in particular cases, but everybody understands that the SG doesn't have the right to defy the Attorney General's expressed directive. As far as the functions of the SG's office are concerned, what we do, uh, the most visible thing that we do is argue cases in the Supreme Court, and as, as Vic said, I've argued 78 three or four a term, most of them pe cases that, that you've never heard of, but that were you know, interesting to me at the, the time. Uh, obviously, one of the ways that we attract really talented lawyers, people who could be making a lot more money working in the private sector, is to offer them essentially the guarantee that if they're hired as assistants, they will get arguments in the Supreme Court, and it's something that people at comparable levels of seniority in the private sector could, if, if it happened to them, it would be an enormous fluke in our office. It's uh, just so, something that you're promised by virtue of working in the office. When, whenever people congratulate me on the number of arguments I've done, I always point out that it, it helps if you have a federal statute that says that the client has to hire you as its attorney. And you know, there's a provision of the U.S. Code that says the Solicitor General conducts Supreme Court litigation on behalf of the United States. So I have a little bit of an unfair advantage. Very occasionally, people from our office will argue cases in the courts of appeals. Uh, I've argued a couple of antitrust cases in courts of appeals for, for the last, during the last few years. I, I think that both times it happened, I don't know this for sure, but the sense that I got was that there was a little bit of an internal squabble among the people who would ordinarily have argued the cases in the courts of appeals, and none of them wanted one of the others of them to do it, and so I was a nice compromise candidate, and I was glad to be uh, selected on that basis. The, the next thing we do, and probably the most important thing we do functionally, is we prepare the briefs on the merits in cases that the, in which the Supreme Court has granted cert. I mean, nobody who's not a judge knows for sure, but the conventional wisdom is that the written brief is a lot more likely to sway the outcome than the oral argument. And so even though the argument is the most visible and in some sense the most exciting thing we do, I think the, the careful preparation of the, the written brief is probably uh, the more important. We also prepare briefs at the petition stage of cases. Th those include both the cert petitions that are filed on behalf of the government, which are pretty small in number, and then we have lots and lots of cases where we win in a court of appeals, and the other side will file a cert petition, and we'll file what's called a brief in opposition, which is a document that tells the Supreme Court why it shouldn't take the case. The, the other thing we do that is less well known is the Solicitor General has to approve any government appeal from an adverse district court decision. And so if we take an appeal from the district court to the Court of Appeals, our office wouldn't usually be the one that is preparing the brief, but the Solicitor General would have to decide whether the appeal would go forward. And to do that, the SG would get recommendations from the litigating division, from a federal agency, from an assistant, from a deputy. So we, we turn out a lot of paper in connection with that process. As you might expect, some cases, everybody within the government who's interested is more or less in agreement about what we should do. And in those cases, the process is, is more truncated. In cases where there's disagreement among the divisions or the federal agencies as to whether we should appeal or not, uh, the process is more elaborate. Often we'll have in-person meetings. I think one of the things that is very 
very heavily ingrained into the assistance is that when they do a recommendation, they're supposed to say what they really, really think we ought to do. They're not supposed to try to predict what the SG is, is likely to decide or to be swayed just by the, the level of ardor on the part of somebody within the government. I mean, we want to take the, the client agency's perspectives into account, but we want to get the independent judgment of the assistant. And if the assistant recommends one thing and the SG ends up deciding something else, I mean, nobody looks at scans at the assistant and feels like he or she has done something wrong. It's just a contribution to the decision-making process that e each person say really what he or th she thinks the right answer is. Another thing I say about the job and kind of Vic's description of my docket areas uh, alludes to it, it, it really helps to be a nerd in my job and it's fortunate because I am. I mean, I think if you are somebody who cares deeply about one particular area of the law, who is passionate about whether it be civil rights or vigorous cr criminal prosecution or protection of the environment, I if that area of the law is your one passion, then frankly our office is not the right place for you because everybody within the office is a generalist, everybody is working on a wide variety of, of subjects and if there was only one that really truly interested you, you would be frustrated, you would feel like the bulk of your time was being spent on things other than what you really wanted to work on. And so I think the people who enjoy the work in the office are people who really like trying to solve legal puzzles, like trying to figure out what the right answer is, like doing close legal analysis, whether the kind of the subject matter of the dispute is something that they find intrinsically interesting uh, or not. The other, and, and the, the other thing I would say in that regard is I think it would be surprising to people who are not deeply familiar with the working of the Supreme Court and the working of our, of our office, kind of how high a percentage of our work it involves subject areas and legal questions as to which the government is taking basically the same position from one administration to the next. That is, if, if you look at the category of Supreme Court cases that make it to the front page of the, the New York Times, you know, you're going to see things like same-sex marriage, abortion, affirmative action. Th those are the types of legal questions as to which it is fairly predictable that a Republican administration might take a different position from a Democratic administration. But the great, great majority of what we do is it's much more technical legal questions. They are important to people who are concerned with particular areas of the law or particular areas of the, the economy, but they are not questions as to which there's a distinct Republican and Democratic administration and uh, position. And, and that's really the bulk of our work, even though it's not uh, the type of work that is most likely to, to show up on the front page of the papers. Uh, the, the last case, the most recent case I argued was a, a patent case back at the end of November, it hasn't been decided yet. I mean, within the patent community, it was enormously contentious. There were something like 20 to 25 amicus briefs on each side of the case. People cared deeply about it, but trust me, there's no, there's no difference between Republican and Democratic views about how the patent law should work. It's, it's much more technical legal disputes, and, and that's much more characteristic of our work than of uh, the more politicized types of cases. The, the other thing that's really been striking to me about working in the SG's office is years before law school I read about the office and it seemed fascinating and I had the image of it as this you know, small group of very smart people who tried to wall themselves off from lesser minds and kind of think deep thoughts without being contaminated by... That's, by, that's faculty. <laughs> right. <laughs> Think, think deep thoughts without being kind of contaminated by uh, people who were not part of the, the, the club. And the, the reality has been very different and it's, it's great that it is different. When, when we're writing a brief or when we're deciding whether to take an appeal or file a cert petition, we get lots of paper, we get recommendations from the agencies, we get recommendations from the litigating division, sometimes from multiple agencies. and. You know, there, there are things that, as a result of my training, I know about the Supreme Court that a lot of these people can't be expected to know, but conversely, there are things about particular statutes, how things work on the ground, how particular industries operate that 
members of the, the agencies are far more knowledgeable about than I am. And so kind of the, the aspiration is that when we write a brief, we take advantage of everybody's respective area of expertise and, and when the process works well, we, we wind up with a brief that's a lot better than any one person on the team could have written alone. And so it's, I, I really love the, the Office of Solicitor General, but it absolutely couldn't do anything like the work it does without a, a great deal of collaboration from other parts of the, the government. The, the other thing we do and the other way that we get valuable input is, you know, some of the cases that make it to the Supreme Court are cases in which the government is a party and we've already filed you know, in most instances, a brief in the district court, a brief in the court of appeals. There's still some refinement to do. It's, it's often surprising that you can come up with new takes on the argument even at the Supreme Court stage, but the basic outlines of the, our position have already been determined. But a lot of times the Supreme Court will grant cert and it's a case involving private parties. It's not one that the, the government has previously been involved with. And then we, we have to make a decision. Do we want to file an amicus brief? And if so, do we want, what, what do we want it to say? And that involves the same sort of process where we get recommendations from the divisions and the agencies. But in addition to that, we always meet with counsel for the, the two parties. And it's kind of like a moot court. The, the counsel for the petitioner typically will come in first and will start in with his presentation and then he'll, I mean, kind of the nice thing about the meeting is I get to interrupt in the meeting whereas in the oral arguments I'm interrupted, but it's the same sort of process. They, they come in with a prepared pitch, but they also spend a lot of time answering questions and it's often very valuable to us in, in deciding whether to participate and in deciding what the brief should say. And, you know, I always think to myself, even if I go into the meeting with a pretty clear idea of what I think we ought to do, if there's some really good objection to my tentative thinking, then I would rather find out about it in the meeting before we file the brief rather than file the brief and then discover when they file their reply that there's a devastating response after all. And so I think kind of tapping into that input from the, the counsel for the parties has been helpful to our process. You know, as, as you may know, especially in, in D.C., there's a growing phenomenon of big law firms that will have appellate shops within the law firm, and it'll be a, a relatively small group of people who will focus mostly on appellate work. And a lot of the people who do that sort of work in D.C. are people who used to work in the SG's office. They're my former colleagues. So uh, more and more of the, me the meetings that I go to with private counsel about what position we should take in, in a case are meetings with people that I used to work with. And, and they are, I think, especially savvy about understanding what are the criteria that the government considers in deciding to, whether to file an amicus brief. Uh, so their pitch is a little bit more tailored to, to us than uh, others might be. Uh, the, one other thing I wanted to talk about just briefly is kind of why do you have an SG's office? I mean, I think somebody could make a cogent argument that it's really more efficient to just let the lawyers who've already been litigating the case uh, in the district court and the court of appeals continue with it because they're the ones who, who know the case better and have already invested time in it. You know, I think one of the reasons is you do get a lot of category, a large category of cases in the Supreme Court where we haven't been involved in the lower courts and we have to make a decision in the Supreme Court. Uh, the other thing is people in the office don't build up quite the same type of subject matter expertise as people who only work on patents or only work on Clean Water Act or only work on bankruptcy. But we do build up expertise with respect to the Supreme Court. At, at any given time, we have, a, you know, as Vic points out with Bush versus Gore, an imperfect but still a pretty good idea of what these nine men and women are most likely to find uh, persuasive and I think that gives us an advantage and as I say we're, we're trying to file briefs that take advantage of each person's respective area of expertise and then I think the second reason for having an SG's office is we attach a lot of importance to consistency of government litigation and we, we get cases in which we, we get legal questions as to which in one case 
a particular answer might be advantageous to the government, and in another case, the opposite answer would be advantageous to the government. And we have a strong internal sense that we don't want to be playing games. We want to have a consistent position, and in, in cases where that position is not advantageous to us, we, we want to accept that. And the fact that we have a centralized process, at least for authorizing appeals and for Supreme Court litigation, doesn't eliminate the possibility that we might wind up taking inconsistent positions in lower courts, uh, but it reduces it. And, and then the last thing I want to talk about just briefly is the experience of arguing in the Supreme Court. I think the, the first few arguments I did, I literally, as I drove in to work in the morning, I hoped that I would get in a car wreck. I, <laughs> I was never tempted to cause a car wreck because that would just be humiliating if you missed your Supreme Court argument because you had been a bad driver. But I always thought if somebody smashed into me, that would be win-win. And <laughs> I've, I've gotten past that point, uh, but it's in kind of, it has gradually, gradually gotten less nerve-wracking over the years, but it's still very far from being routine. I think it's, you know, for those of you who've done sports or have kind of played music in front of people or done dancing or, or anything like that, most of the nervousness is before it starts. Usually once the argument actually begins, I'm kind of caught up in it and I no longer feel nervous. But, the, you know, the day or two before the argument starts, uh, it it's still feels very intimidating. I, one great experience that I had a few years ago, I was arguing against uh, Maureen Mahoney, who had previously been in our office, and is just, she's a wonderful lawyer and tremendous advocate, and always just seems like the most poised person you could imagine, completely un unflappable. And I was going to be arguing against her, and so we were sitting just a few feet apart on, on either side of the podium. And about five minutes before the argument was going to start, she leaned over and said, I hate this. And so I felt like if somebody who was as good at the job as, as she was and as experienced at it still had that feeling that at least I wasn't alone. And our, our best preparation for argument is everybody in the office who's going to be arguing in this case in the Supreme Court will have two moot courts, and the people who sit on the moot court will be some of the people from the division and agency who've actually worked on the case. But for each moot court, we pick three new assistants, people who haven't had any prior exposure to the case, but we'll read the briefs. We'll try to think of the questions that the, the justices might ask. And I think those people are, they're, they're the best predictors of the questions that are actually asked at the argument. Because sometimes the people who are too deeply immersed in the case, it's, it's hard for them to remember how this, the case would come across to somebody who, who was smart but hadn't been living with it for, for years. And so typically the, the moot court, the question and answer part lasts for an hour, and the idea is to make the moot court more unpleasant than the argument could possibly be, and it usually works. And you know, part part of it is people will spend 90% of the time on the weakest 10% of the case. Part of it is that in the actual argument, it doesn't happen very often, but once in a while you'll get positive feedback where you'll give an answer and a justice will nod and will give you some cue that he actually found that persuasive. In the moot court, you get none of that. You could give the best answer that anyone could think of, and people will shake their head as though, you know, you've just embarrassed yourself yet again. And then the second half of the moot court is about an hour of what we call postmortem feedback, and it's really remarkable how quickly people will shift from kind of destructive mode to constructive mode, and will have very good suggestions. You know, I liked your answer to such and such a question. On the other question, maybe if you tweaked it this way, it would be better. And it's really, it's astonishingly helpful, and it's, it's astounding how much work people will put into preparing for moot courts in, in cases that are not theirs. And I think the, the impetus for starting to do the moot courts in the first place was just to make people better at oral argument. But I think one of the effects it's had on the office is to create a sense of camaraderie that you know, there can be a certain amount of compartmentalization in our work where for any case it's the SG and one deputy and one assistant who are working on the case and 
often you don't know much about what your colleague, the details of what your colleagues are working on, and the moot courts are a chance for people to, to kind of get a sense of other people's work. If, if you do the moot court, you're, you know what the case is about and you're more likely to go to see the argument, and so I think it's, it's reinforced the sense of, of camaraderie in the office, which, which I think is really good. I think we have a group of people who are, they're, they're very, very talented and they got to the office because they were competitive and yet for the period that they're in the office, nobody's really competing against each other. There, there really is a good cooperative ethic. And then the, the last thing I'd say about the, the process of arguing in the Supreme Court that you just, that as an advocate, you have to, to keep in mind at, at all times is it, it's all about the questions that there, there may have been a day when getting ready for a Supreme Court argument meant coming up with a careful, prepared speech and being pre be prepared to, to give it uh, without stumbling. And now you sort of think to yourself, what would I say if they gave me five minutes to talk, but it never actually happens. Really the focus is on thinking of as many questions as, as you can. How would you answer them best? How would you try to work into your answer to a hostile question, some affirmative point? And not only do you get frequent questions, but you get follow-up questions that are not necessarily follow-up questions. And so often I'll get what is a great question, something that goes to the core of the case. And if I were guaranteed you have 90 seconds to answer this, I'd answer it one way. I might start with something that wasn't terribly important, but that was the logical foundation and then work up to the most important point. One of the things I've learned through experience is you just can't answer questions that way in the Supreme Court because the likelihood is too great that after 15 seconds you'll be interrupted and you won't have said the most important thing. So you, one of the, the skills you try to develop in answering questions is say the most important thing first and then if you're given an opportunity, kind of backfill and, and give an explanation, but don't try to work up from the less important thing to the more important thing because you may never get out the more important thing. So. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it.